Spin and Spin Cube are, are two tools to help you build serverless WebAssembly functions uh, and then deploy those out uh, in, into, into your Kubernetes cluster or wherever your Kubernetes cluster lives. Hello, everyone. We are back here at OP at Microsoft Show. And I have Matt Butcher. Hey, Matt. How are you? Hi. Good to be here. Welcome, and we're going to talk about something very nice that's WebAssembly that I love. And tell me about Spin and SpinCube, like both since have projects now. How can we build, we're going to talk about how can, how can you build that WebAssembly fabulous platform in Kubernetes. Um, yeah, tell me about Bo, explain for the public what's Spin and SpinCube. Okay, so uh, you know, Spin and SpinCube are are two tools to help you build serverless WebAssembly functions uh, and then deploy those out uh, in, into into your Kubernetes cluster or wherever your Kubernetes cluster lives, whether it's an AKS cluster or locally or on prem. So Spin is the developer tool. With Spin, you can go from blinking cursor to a deployed application in two minutes or less. That's our favorite core user story for the product. And then SpinCube is the Kubernetes runtime, one of the places where you can deploy spin applications. Uh, and it might be, I, I mean, would it be helpful for me to just sort of talk about why WebAssembly would even go in the server and use that to sort of dive into the specifics of the project? Yeah, it should be. Uh, I like the thing that when you looking for the project, we see, you know, three main things, we portability, sandboxing, also, you know, that fast starting and, one of the biggest problems on um, serverless platforms are the, the cool start. You know, we have yeah. like platforms yeah. on Azure and anything. How, how can we dig a little bit on that space? Yeah, yeah. So let me put up a, my, my all-time favorite way to articulate sort of why we did what we did. Uh, you know, I've been around in the, in the server-side world for most of my career, including in the kind of pre, pre-cloud side. And we all, we, you know, initially, the way I ran things in like the early 2000s was... You know, we had bare metal servers sitting in a data center. And when we deployed applications, we pushed them out on there and applications were running, you know, as many applications as we could pack onto one operating system uh, as we could get away with. Right. Uh, and in that case, you know, we were constrained largely by the fact that we were looking at the hardware and the software as having the operating system as having sort of a one to one relationship. Right. You run exactly one operating system on your bare metal. So when virtual machines came out, that kind of changed the game, right? And suddenly we could have lots of different operating systems running on the same piece of hardware. Uh, it didn't take long for a couple of clever people uh, to say, hey, we could lease out the servers in our data center and other people could pay us to run our, their copies of their operating system on our hardware. And thus, you know, sort of the modern cloud was born. Um, but you know, virtual machines are big and they're cumbersome. And as a developer, I really don't like building virtual machine images because I have to take responsibility for everything from the kernel and drivers up through the application that I'm that I'm building. And it's a whole lot to maintain. So I think while virtual machines have always been sort of like the stalwart piece of the cloud, they'll always be there. We always use them. Uh, they're not the piece that's the most compelling for the developer, right? So then along came containers uh, and Docker built this, incredibly elegant way for me as a developer to take my one little microservice or my one little server and package up that one long running process in a little kind of like pie slice of an operating system and deploy that out. And containers have been a fabulous way to deploy long running servers. Um, so, you know, I was, at, I was at Microsoft when we were doing a lot of this work. Uh, you know, I've been deeply in the Kubernetes ecosystem since the very beginning. And, uh, and we were working on a whole bunch of different Kubernetes projects. Some of them you probably know well, like Helm and, and CNAB and, and things like that. Others like Draft, where we tried to build a platform as a service, very lightweight on top of Kubernetes. Uh, we, we built a whole bunch of things like that, right? All of which revolved around the container ecosystem. But at some point, what we started hearing developers say was, hey, we really like this other model, right? Next to, next to containers, a serverless thing where instead of writing an entire long running server process that runs for days, weeks, months, whatever, I really like this model where I just write basically event handlers and a request comes in and I handle it and do my thing and then send a response. Like 
every HTTP request, you start up a new instance of that serverless function and you handle just that request and, and return just one response and then you shut down. Uh, and but that's the, why I meant, and that's why the code start is important. Oh, yeah, and, and ex also, exactly. And also the, the main issue we have with containers is that we have to build the image for each one of the platforms. If we have mm -hmm. ARM64, if we have AMD, and yep. I want that WebAssembly like is a game changer on that side. That's both yeah. sides there as well. Yeah, and kind of the first generation of serverless, like AWS Lambda, like Azure Functions, was built on older technology, on virtual machines technology, and consequently, cold start time was like. 200 to 500 milliseconds, way beyond what any browser user is going to wait to start to see that page rendering. And like you said, the other thing is, you know, containers also have a cold start problem. And we end up building the same image multiple times, once for ARM on Windows, once for ARM on Linux, once for I, you know, I3, you know, we end up having to build. And it's not just compiling or running a Docker build command. It's like actually rebuilding parts of the application, depending on the underlying libraries that they need to use. And WebAssembly for us was the technology that solved all of that, right? It was originally a browser technology, but it was a secure environment. It was highly portable. A WebAssembly binary can run on just about any architecture, any operating system, not even just the big ones, right? The small niche RTOS operating systems. And we were looking at this going, ooh, this would be really cool to kind of pull this out and and be able to put a WebAssembly runtime on the cloud to be able to do serverless style workloads. And that was kind of the intuition that got us going uh, when we were building Spin and SpinCube. Uh, Spin being the first one we wanted to build, we knew that, eh, okay, Docker did something absolutely brilliant, right? Uh, when they introduced the, the the container model and Docker Docker files and Docker builds, they managed to make it attractive to developers, not operators, not necessarily, you know, their target audience wasn't, you know, SREs or anything like that. Their target audience was developers who were building applications. They said, it's so easy for you to just write this one Docker file and then you can package up all of your thing to run in this great way and you can deliver this over to the ops team. And what that did is it eliminated a fundamental friction between the operations team that's charged with running something for a long time and the developer team who's responsible to saying for saying, here's the thing we need to run, here's the ideal circumstances in which it runs, right? And so we wanted to replicate that with WebAssembly uh, mm -hmm. and, and make it really easy for a developer to say, yeah, I can build a, web, a serverless function, compile it to WebAssembly and very easily deliver it to my team who's gonna deploy it out into production. So Spin was really our effort to build that kind of tool. Uh, so you can go from, uh, you know, our, our kind of core user story, the, the the guiding story we had the entire time we were building the first first year that we were working on Spin was, as a as a developer, I should be able to get from blinking cursor to a deployed application in two minutes or less. In other words, the Hello World story had to be under two minutes. Uh, Radio, who's the CTO of Fermion, likes to say, and we did it in 66 seconds by the end of that year. Uh, in fact, if you want, we could run through one here just to give you sort of a let's flavor. Show, let's show your screen and um, show us exactly how that works, SP and SPQ, how they they get together and from the development yeah. to the deployment. So here I'm going to just make sure I got the right, yep, I got my current version of spin. So I'm going to do a spin new and uh, we'll just call it a hello world here. And... When I run that command, it's going to prompt me and say, okay, what kind of thing are you building? Uh, and I'm going to say, all right, I want to build, uh, let's do an HTTP app. Let's use JavaScript. So, you know, this is a nice, easy one, uh, basic program here. Uh, I'm going to have it listen on the default path. So that has now scaffolded out my new Hello World project. So if I look in here, I can see I've got a very basic project, including that index.js file. So I'm going to use VS Code because it's my current favorite editor, has been for a long, long time. So here's our VS Code um, editor. And I can go ahead and kind of cruise around here and see there's my index.javascript file. It's got a little Hello Universe handler in there. If you've written a lot of JavaScript code, you look at this and go, oh, yeah. So basically I'm writing a basic application, but I have no server, right? I'm just writing the event handling functions for it. So from here, uh, I'm gonna head back to my terminal. I could actually do all of this inside of uh, VS Code if I open the terminal there, but I'm just gonna run a spin build. 
First thing it's gonna do is run the NPM install on my behalf to get all the dependencies in there. And then it's gonna compile all of this into a WebAssembly binary. So literally our JavaScript is gonna end up bundled up inside of a WebAssembly, a .wasm file. So at the end of this particular build script here, uh, I will see I now have a dist directory and if I look inside of dist, there's hello world.wasm. So I've just went from blinking cursor to compiled application. If I do a spin up here, I'm gonna start up a copy of that and it's gonna start on port 3000 and I can open a new terminal here and do a curl local host 3000. Another thing, Matt, is that very lightweight, the size is like a byte. Eh? Uh, yeah, so the size of this one, actually that's a really good uh, question there um, because, oh, I'm in the wrong tab. Uh, if I look at the, the dist, I'll do an LAH on dist. What I'm going to see for this one, um, let me put a dash in there. There we go. Uh, what I'm going to see here is about a 12 meg file. Why am I seeing 12 meg for hello world in this case? If I were to do the same thing with Rust, we'd be talking a couple K. Now here's what's interesting. So we got to compile all of these to WebAssembly. Uh, when I compile JavaScript, I actually have to compile the JavaScript interpreter into WebAssembly. So that starts at about 11 meg, and then from there, I'm just adding source code here and there. Uh, so JavaScript tends to produce bigger WebAssembly binaries, whereas uh, C, Rust, Language Go, the languages that are compiled, they tend to be you know from a few hundred K to a few meg for something like a Hello World. Uh, so it is definitely smaller than what I would get if I were building a container image. Uh, but it is definitely larger than than what I would normally consider sort of like a small thing, right? And so it's going to depend on language there. So once I've got it, though, running like that, then the question is, well, yeah, I can run it locally. Where else should I be able to run it? Uh, and, you know, early on, we built Fermion Cloud, which is an easy developer experience. Uh, AKS has built in a spin runtime, which is actually built on SpinCube, which I'll show you in just a second here. Uh, we, recently, we've partnered with Akamai, so you can deploy to Akamai's Edge. What you should be hearing in this is, oh, wait, I can deploy to a whole bunch of different places because that's the virtue of WebAssembly. The, the binary format, once you've got it in WebAssembly, it doesn't really matter what the remote architecture looks like. As long as it's got the runtime to be able to execute that spin app, you can deploy it into all kinds of places. I can I quickly show just the spin and spin cube just for people to understand how that complement each other? And also yeah. the open source project. Then yes. if you want to dig a little bit, watching this, if you want to you know, dig on the content, I'm, we're going to leave some um, information on the video description as well. But yeah, yeah show me your So this, here, if we pop up this little diagram here, uh, you can kind of see how things work when you, when you move into the Kubernetes world, right? So inside of your Kubernetes cluster, you just run an operator. The operator uh, has a shim installed inside of ContainerD. So what you're literally doing is running WebAssembly instead of running a container image at the lowest level of Kubernetes. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, what that says about Kubernetes is Kubernetes is really powerful. If you can just drop in a, a completely different runtime right alongside your container runtime and just have everything work. And that's kind of the way it goes. So you can run these commands like, you know, the spin new, spin build. And then when you're ready, you deploy it into a registry, which is just like Docker Hub or any of the usual container, GCHR, any of the ones you normally use. And then you just use, um, uh, you know, either scaffold it out, scaffold out uh, some YAML, you can build a Helm chart, you can do spin cube deploy, uh, and any of these things will just push it into SpinCube. So SpinCube is an open source project, as is Spin. Uh, and let me pop up sort of like the, the easy way to get started on all of this. Uh, in the Spin Framework project on GitHub, you'll find basically all the different pieces and parts of the Spin ecosystem. So Spin, that developer tool, is right there. Uh, spin Operator is the operator piece of SpinCube. Uh, if you go to uh, spincube.dev, spincube.dev, uh, then you can you know, download and read through how to install uh, SpinCube into your Kubernetes cluster. But all of these things should be very easy for you to get going. Again, Spin and SpinCube are both part of CNCF, uh, which means they're part of the whole Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, we'd love to have you drop in to the GitHub project, to the, uh, to the Slack, to the Discord, and chat with us about how to get started and where you can contribute.
That, that sounds great. And uh, um, I like the component, spin components as well. It's something that we can even maybe do another video later on just on the component side and how that become like a you know development platform for serverless yep. for so many use cases. Thanks a lot, Matt, for, for coming and for showing that for us. Yep. And... Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, Spin, Spin Cube, really fun projects to play around with. And I think, you know, as we kind of started off with this whole serverless workflow just opens a whole lot of, a whole bunch of new opportunities for building really, really fast serverless uh, functions inside of your Kubernetes cluster or wherever you want to run your WebAssembly. Yeah, sure. And don't forget to leave a star on the project if you like it. Subscribe to the Microsoft Developer Channel and follow the Open at Microsoft show. And see you all next time. Thank you. Thanks.